It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is The Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Historic day, historic day in America. Uh, Absolutely, positively, without question, uh, the most historic Labor Day in, in, in my lifetime. A president walking the picket line. Uh, and that's what Joe Biden did today, supporting striking workers, uh, getting out there, doing the doing the work, picking up the jelly bucket, going to work. And, you know, I, I got I got to show the, uh, the the president and, you know, and what he had to say, which which, again, historic, historic stuff right here. So here's the uh, here is President Biden on the, speaking to the people on the picket line. Wall Street didn't build the country. The middle class built the country. <laughs> And unions built the middle class. That's a fact. So let's keep going. You deserve what you've earned, and you've earned a hell of a lot more than you're getting paid now. Thank you very much. And that right there, that is the frame. Right there's the frame. You you deserve with you what you earn, and you earn a lot more than you're being paid. That's the right frame right there. So what did our corporate controlled media throw up at us today? Uh, you got a president, first time in history, history, history in the making. How did they distract? How did they divide? Well, well, you got you got Axios, scoop Biden's team, don't let him trip mission. Fox News, Biden nearly stumbles exiting Air Force One hours after exposed efforts by team to prevent more falls. New York Post, Biden uses physical therapy, tennis shoes, and shorter stairs to dodge falls. Forbes magazine, Biden slips on Air Force One after staff try to prevent major falls. And gaffes raise concern about age. And again, this is all about focusing on the age, focusing on don't think about all the other stuff that's going on. No, no, can't can't have that. And this is the part that, that blows my mind. Uh, they do an excellent job of distracting us at every turn. And we've come to expect, and and look, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, now, you've got a sitting U.S. president supporting workers, so the past guy's got to get in on this, right? So Donald Trump says he's going to be going to Michigan on Wednesday, uh, reportedly to a non-union facility. Uh, with mostly retired UAW members. I love what UAW President Sean Fain said uh, to CNN. Uh, He said he's not going to meet with Trump in Michigan. Uh, He says, quote, I don't think the man has any bit of care about what our workers stand for, what the working class stands for. He serves the billionaire class, and that is what is wrong with our country. And I 100% Agree, Fain is spot on accurate, and I defy you to find people who dis- who who would say that that's a wrong statement. And I point to, I point to Donald Trump, two weeks after the UAW made massive concessions, uh, back in December of 2008 to the Big Three. I mean, the the things that they were told, you give these up, help save us, and you'll get something back down the end of the road. Trump was on the the Fox, um. Saying, well, saying, saying this. Years and years of deep seated. And you know, I see it in my own company. Well, my company is a lot newer. Over the years, we have Christmas bonus time, right? And we've done well. Now, I pay somebody a bonus 20 years ago. Then you give them a little more, a little more, a little more. Now it's 20 years later. All of a sudden, I'm saying, I'm paying them too much. 
I'm paying them too much. I mean, I'm paying some guys much more than I should be paying. You know why? Time. Same thing with the unions. They get a little increase, they get another, another. What are your guys? 40, do you 50 give them years a condo, ago? or what do you give them? No, I just give them bonuses. But you know, I always but like I to give them a But I know it's not a hickory more. cheese lot. No, know that. I'm not even talking about top level people. Okay. I'm talking about you go a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. All of a sudden, 20 years is up, and now you're saying, man, that's a lot of money. I'm sitting behind but my desk. They expect checks. it, right? They expect December it. rolls around and I think Don's going to be good to me. You no, know, it's the same thing with the unions. That's right. They get their little 5%. They get another 2%. They get another 3%, 4%. Then all of a sudden, they're making more money than the people that own the company. All of a sudden, they're making more money than the people owning the company. Really? <laughs> Did you not see General Motors CEOs pay $29 million? Did you not see the $25 million at Stellantis or the $22 at Ford? Did you not? Did we miss that? Did we miss the quarter of a trillion dollars in profit over the last 10 years going to the, the folks there at the at the very top? Did we, did we miss that? And the answer is no, they didn't miss it at all. Uh, look, this is what this is what corporate America thinks of workers. What Donald Trump said is what the billionaire class thinks of working people. That you don't deserve anything. You don't earn it. Everything's for them. And if they have to share, well, that's that's completely out of bounds. And if they can squeeze you when you're down, if they can kick you harder when you're down, they're going to do it. And I look at Stephen Ratner. Now, remember, Stephen Ratner, Democrat, uh, Obama's auto czar was out today doing the round saying for Biden to be on the picket line is outrageous. There's no precedent for it. The tradition of the president is to stay neutral in these three things. He said, I get the politics. The progressives all said, we don't want a mediator. We want an advocate. And he bowed to the progressives. And now he's going out there uh, with his thumb on the scale and it's wrong. no. No, no, you see, see, neolib, you're missing something. Uh, because again, this is the guy who's at the top of the Democratic intelligentsia. This is the this is the Democrat that I want out. These are the neoliberals who have harmed workers for decades, along with the with the conservatives. These are basically moderate Republicans. These are the Democrats we need to expose and out. And thank goodness, thank goodness for Joe Biden in this moment. Because remember, this is a guy who back, you know, in 2011 was given speeches to these big economic, the Detroit Economic Club, saying that I think we could have done a little bit better on the job, particularly at GM, you know, and squeezing those workers, you know, combining through, you know, massive liabilities and contracts and things that they have. He said, I think had we more time, we might have asked all of the stakeholders to sacrifice a little bit more. And who's he talking about? He said, we didn't ask any active workers to cut his or her pay. We didn't ask them to sacrifice any of their pension. And maybe, we maybe could have asked them to do a little bit more. Which means we could have squeezed the worker just a little bit more. Now remember, this is the guy who managed Mike Bloomberg's billions. This is a guy who got himself into a little trouble with the New York Pension Fund where he couldn't do business and pensions for five years. This is a guy who's been in the inside of all of this stuff telling us, lecturing us now that, whoa, we can't have Biden there. That's bad. How dare he side with working people? And I got to tell you, it is refreshing in about damn time that we have politicians who are willing to stand up and say, I don't care what party you are. I don't care if you wear a red hat or a blue hat or a green hat or no hat. You should have a job that pays a living wage with health and retirement security and an and opportunity. Thank goodness for Joe Biden in this moment, having the courage to stand up and do what Obama said he would do. Obama said he was going to do a lot and didn't. So if it takes him putting on tennis shoes so that he doesn't trip and fall, is that really the scandal of the day? You know what the scandal of the day is? Uh, Trump being, you know, well, the Trump organization going to be dissolved. Uh, the trial that's coming up on October 2nd is kind of a, just a mere formality. And I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about this. Trump had a massive meltdown over the fact that for years, for decades, he's been getting away with fraud. He's been pumping uh, the, the price of assets when it benefits him, and he's been cutting them down to nothing when it benefits him. 
And I said this when he ran. I said, you know, this is a guy who's who's known for grift. This is a guy who's known for shady dealings, for screwing people in business deals all the time. This is a guy who's known for this by exposing himself. All this stuff's going to come out. And it is. Now, what I found interesting is his defense. And this is the part, because he came out today and said, Mar-a-Lago is worth, you know, 100 times the 18 million that the judge claimed that it was worth. Uh, by the way, I checked Zillow. Um, Mar-a-Lago is worth $24 million, according to Zillow, who have in the past been known to inflate prices. And that's only $976 million less than Eric said it's worth, and only $1,776,000,000 short of what Donald Trump claims it's worth. Exactly what got him into trouble. Now, here's the defense, and this is why working people had better lift your little heads up and start thinking about what's going on. His defense, this is th what the judge wrote. He also seems to imply, Trump being he, also seems to imply that the numbers cannot be inflated. So th the numbers can't. The, the hotels, uh, the, the Mar-a-Lago, none of this stuff can be inflated, he believes. Because he could find a buyer from Saudi Arabia to pay any price he suggests. Stop and think about that for a minute. Think about your home, because I was on Zillow today and I found the value of my home. And let's say it's worth $100,000. I know I can't find someone to give me $500,000. Wish I could. Can't. How many working people know folks who are going to come in, whatever you want? And this, again, is part of his his quest for power, his, his wheeling and dealing and He's in a unique position to get whatever he wants. This is an interesting defense. But for him to say it out loud, <laughs> you know, even more interesting. And the fact that the Red Hats are never going to listen to this. The fact that he said, look, I can just sell it to Saudi Arabia. Whatever Saudi Arabia wants. You know, the folks who attacked us on 9-11. Just kind of throwing that out there. But I want to hear your thoughts. Does that matter? Does that defense hold water? You know, I, I couldn't possibly inflate the price because I can get whatever I want because there are people that either I'm in their pocket or they're in mine that are going to give me whatever I want. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. But From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is, though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Unions are making a comeback. More organizing in the last couple of years than in a long time. And the Biden administration being more supportive of unions than any president since FDR. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice as Americans. I took two years of electric in high school and I was the only girl in the class there. Here, I'm the only girl as far as installers go. I'm a single mom too. I joined the union because it gave me options for health care and life insurance so that I know my son's taken care of. I like what I do, like this is the best job I've ever had. You think solar panels is more like California. You wouldn't think Appalachia would have any. It would be smart if the government would invest more in clean energy resources. 
I got to tell you, I'm extraordinarily proud of Joe Biden today. You know, good on him for going out there and, and and really standing up for working people, and not just you know walking the walk uh, that he did today and, and talking the talk. It's all of it. The fact that the things he's done at the NLRB, putting Jennifer Abruzzo in charge of that, uh, the OSHA, the Labor Department, the things that are happening. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the the infrastructure bills that have labor standards in them. This is the kind of guy we want in the White House. Let's go to the phones. Got Steve from Chicago on line one. Steve, how are you? Good, and and I agree with you. I mean, you know, th- this is the difference between walking the walk and talking the talk. I mean, Donald Trump apparently is surprised that you know, given inflation and so forth, that you might be paying somebody more 10, 15, 20 years down the road than you were paying them. A, a generation ago. I mean, what a surprise. It's as if, you know, having been the president for four years, no one ever, you know, informed him of this concept of inflation. So, I mean, it, it, in other words, you need to play people more just to keep up with the cost of living increases in this country. So, I, I mean, again, he never ceases to amaze me in terms of what the level of ignorance he has with regard to the basics of public policy. But in any case, I mean, here, here you have someone like Joe Biden who's out there actually championing championing the cause of the working man in this country and as you pointed out you know what you're going to have is donald trump is going to go to a uh, a non-union shop and he's going to uh, and he's going to address what's going on in this country uh, by talking to people who aren't members of the union that's currently striking i mean you talk about ridiculous you know but of course you know he can't go to a union shop because he probably get laughed out even his sort of adolescent advisors could tell him that you know i mean look we, we go to a union shop, you're likely to get booed in the midst of a strike. So like, we need to go to a non-union shop. And then, of course, I'm sure they're going to stack the audience who's ever there, making sure that they vet them so that, you know, Donald Trump doesn't get booed. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is an example of what, you know, what we've talked about before. You know, that we've got, uh, we know that government can do things for people to improve the quality of their life. And when they don't do anything, you know, things can happen that affects us that affects us in a manifestly negative way. We we just had a report out with regard to uh, child poverty. We went from 5.2 to 12.4 percent, 140 percent increase in child poverty in one year. Why? Because you know the programs that we had established during COVID, uh, especially the child tax credit, yeah, you know, those uh, those ran out. They sunset, and uh, not surprised uh, not a surprise to anyone. Child poverty skyrocketed, but because it demonstrates that we can actually do something to impact things in this country manifestly, such as child poverty. And when we don't do them, or when we sunset them, that what's going to happen? Well, yeah, somebody's going to suffer. In this case, children are suffering. Yep. And, and so uh, I think that that's what Republicans are afraid of more so than anything else. That you know that the, these plans work, and God forbid that we should adopt them on a permanent basis. And God forbid that somebody should have to pay for them. I don't know, like the people making billions in this economy over the last generation. So th- that's what they're afraid of. No, and, no, you know, because right. we might they actually, don't want to share. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we might start to think of the world in the way Europeans do. You know, there are billionaires in Europe. And you know what? People are taxed at a high rate, and their, their social safety nets are, are much better than ours. They're, you don't go broke trying to pay for a college education. You know, you don't go broke if you get sick. Yeah, and, and there's no movement. There's no movement of people on the streets in Europe, Western Europe especially, of people demanding a libertarian uh, uh, public policy alternative. Sorry, doesn't exist. You will see people on the streets if you try and cut their programs there, but you're not going to see it, anybody protesting in the streets demanding some laissez-faire free market system as we have in the United States with regard to education, health care, workplace standards. Uh, uh, what what they pay people, pension plans. No, nope, you're not going to see that anywhere. I guess the Europeans, uh, you know, they, they're not aware that these philosophies exist. Or is it just that they think they're so absurd that none of them would ever support them? No, I'm with you. But I, you know, I'm, I'm happy thinking like my grandparents' generation did, much the same way that we take care of our neighbors, we take care of our communities, we take care of the least among us. I know we talk Christian nation a lot, but not not Christian values or Christian actions. Well, and on that note, it's, it's always interesting. You'll find uh, Republicans and conservatives who want to talk about abortion and homosexuality. I hate to break it to you, my friends, but there are a couple of references to those things in the New and Old Testament, and that's it. They, you know, it's almost as if you know somebody forgot. Uh, it was an afterthought that somebody forgot about. 
You know what there is in the Old and New Testament? Over 3,000 references to what we owe to the poor. Yep. And how, what we need to do in terms of treating the poor well. But, you know, that part of the Bible, which, again, <laughs> is exponentially larger, you know, they forget about. But the parts of, that are just sort of fleeting references about homosexuality and, uh, and abortion and things like that, oh, yeah, no, no, that we have to live by, you know. The right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Forget the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. Same yeah, thing. Steve, another, I appreciate another topic for another night. There you go. I appreciate Thank the you. thoughts. Thanks so much. Uh, and let's go to line two. We got Alice on line two. Quick, Alice, what's up? How, what's what's on your mind? Insane, right? No, not today. All right. I have a I have a message for you, by the way, from Garden Crown. She said to tell you that she gave you your wish about Biden walking the picket line. She's currently working on your wish for um, Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> but what I wanted to comment on was. Um, I was reading the article in in Washington Post about Biden walking the picket line and how about it being historical. And the right wing trolls were commenting and losing their ever loving minds about him walking the picket That's line. That's what I love about it. That it is absolutely what I love you about know, it. That they are losing their minds. I know. Well, I think they've already lost it. But it did, the article did bring up that uh, Trump was visiting a non-union um, branch of workers at the same time, pretty much. But I thought to myself, well, I did get a few good zingers in on the trolls. I told them to go back to Breitbart and go to Facebook. But uh, you have a good evening, Rick. Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it. Uh, no, I mean, this is this is what, you know, as Steve was talking about, this is the conservative worldview. You know, screw those poor people. Uh, yesterday, we talked about Ice Cream Friday. You may remember the, the elementary school in Ohio that, well, you know, if you don't have any money on your account or if you're if you're behind, no ice cream for you. Uh, well, Robert in uh, Oregon sent me an email uh, on this topic. He said, love the show. Been listening for a couple of months. I'm a UPS teamster, and I live in Portland, Oregon. Listen to your show from last night. Uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts regarding the school using the kids as pawns in the ice cream Friday. He said, I was in third or fourth grade in the late 90s. My mother was a single parent. I remember getting free and reduced lunch for a good portion of elementary school. But there was a point where my mother started making enough money that I didn't qualify anymore. He said, a few times I remember not having enough money in my account and not having money with me. I then had to get out of line. And they gave me whatever they gave kids that didn't have the money. A scoop of mashed potatoes and gravy or a couple pieces of bread and a slice of cheese between. It is a very humiliating thing, he writes, for a 9 or 10-year-old to not be able to get the same lunch and the same ice cream that their friends get. And it's despicable that the school would use the kids as pawns. But it got me thinking on how this helps Republicans who consistently and constantly blame the poor for everything. Uh, when other kids see that kid in the lunch line who can't afford the regular lunch, it's easy for one of the thoughts in their minds to be, I'm glad I'm not that poor kid. As we see things like that more often in our lives, he writes, as we get older, we get into a mentality of blaming the poor for being poor. He says, I'm glad I'm, glad I'm not that guy and he should get a job. Uh, and it creates fear of ending up there ourselves. Republicans in the wealth class know this, and that benefits them. It makes people less likely to fight for better wages, hours, conditions, uh, and or starting a union out of fear of getting fired and losing what they have and ending up like one of those poor people. Keep up the fight in solidarity, Robert. And this is exactly exactly the point, which is why I love what John Fetterman has come out and said. He said, school lunch debt is a term so absurd that it should have never existed. That's why I'm proud to introduce the cancel the nation's student debt meal, uh, meal debt and stop humiliating kids and penalizing hunger. I like how Robert framed that. We're training kids to look backwards on their peers. And, you know, the old George Carlin thing, you know, the rich do, do none of the work, take all the money. The middle class does all the work, uh, pays all of the taxes, and the poor are there to scare the you-know-what out of the middle class. And it is a perfect frame, and it's completely accurate. 
which is why the right has jumped on this bandwagon of ta attacking a social safety net, because you need poor people in conservative land. You can't feed the children and take care of the veterans, and take care of firefighters. You can't. No, no. We can't help the less fortunate because you need them there. You need them there to scare people to show up to crummier and crummier jobs. Uh, but I appreciate the thoughts and the, the emails. You want to email me, Rick, at the ricksmithshow.com is how you do that. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, you'll get ours. We'll take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to the talk. I've been driving buses for five years, and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads, but I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. Then the Teamsters pushed the law so we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. Before we close the program, we want to take a moment to thank our viewers and to share a little bit about why we do what we do. At The Rick Smith Show, we believe that media today is almost entirely controlled by corporate greed. So we have now 24-hour news channels. But instead of 24 hours of news, what we get is one hour repeated 24 times and with, with tons of commercials creating obscene amounts of profits. Information once presented as a public service has now become a private commodity. So when lies make money, lies, lies are what we get. We get a corporate controlled rage machine feeding us anger and hate, trying to convince us that our problems are right, left, or red, blue, when they are and always have been up, down, the wealthiest 1% versus the rest of us. Our goal is is to be an alternative to that machine. Not as a news show with a fancy journalist out front, but as a talk show run by a union truck driver and a team of working class heroes just like you. Everything we do, both what we get right and what we get wrong, is dedicated to advancing the interests of America's working families. No corporate ad buys, no think tanks, no focus groups, no talking points. We are media by working people for working people. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time. <laughs>